Hello, and welcome to online programming at the GCA. Uh, if you have arrived at this page, it means that you are here to take an online class with us. The backbone of the GCA's methodology is that we work from life. And so many of our online classes are somewhat limited. Uh, that's why we offer a lot of classes in master copy and bar drawing, things where we can still practice the basic drawing skills while uh, working from a two-dimensional image, which doesn't quite require the room or extenuating setups like I'm about to explain to you. But if you find yourself in a class where you are required to set something up and draw it from life or paint it from life, I'm here to give you a few suggestions uh, that will make your at-home studio space usable for the purposes of GCA instruction. Uh, the entire concept of form, as we teach it at the GCA, is motivated by a, a kind of like a scientifically controlled environment. Now, obviously that environment can be expanded to include all the beauty that we see in the world with, you know, outside light and all kinds of things like that. But when we're first learning these concepts, it can be very helpful to have a very um, sterile environment. And so I'm here to kind of advise you about some of the steps that you can take to make sure that the experience that you're having with the physical object closely replicates the theories that we're going to describe to you when we teach you this form thinking. The first and most important thing is to have a single light source. I can't tell you how many students I say this to a thousand times and they turn in their work and I'm like, I see 10 highlights, which means you were in a room with track lighting. <laughs> and it's just not that helpful uh, for you to experience the form effects if you're not in a, in a carefully controlled environment with one light source. So let's start with light sources and then we'll take it from there. Uh, it's unfortunate that we need a little bit of a large space to make this one light source thing really work for us. But you don't need an expensive setup. The most important thing about your single light source is that you manage to keep it somewhere between three and six feet away from your object. Three would be very much the minimum distance. So what we don't want, if this was my setup that I'm working for uh, a class on, I don't want a light right here. What happens when I put a light right on top of my objects is that it kind of, if to use a photographic term, it kind of overexposes them. Really what happens is it overwhelms the object with specular reflection, which is what we call highlights. And you don't get to see the color of the object or how the object is really behaving under that single light source. So we want our light to be a minimum of three feet. The further, the better. Uh, the sun, for instance, is a very nice distant light source. But working from natural light has its own uh, pros and cons. We'll talk about that in a second. First, let's assume that you're going to choose to work under artificial light. If you're in a room like I'm in right now, I'm obviously, you know, stylistically spotlighting myself for your effect. But if I didn't have this light on, the only light in my studio is an unfortunate light for working from life. And that is a bay of French windows. Now, they're beautiful and they make working in my studio very comfortable, but they're not ideal for painting under. But I do have enough space to have a, a series of artificial light options here, and I want to discuss some of those with you. The first and probably least convenient for you to acquire would be what we call a, a photography light, right? It's a soft box. It is an unwieldy apparatus. You can see it's huge. Um, it is not very expensive. You get a set of two for about $100. Um, you can just ser search on Amazon or B&H or wherever you wanna go for a photographer's light, and they call this a soft box. That's mostly because it has this big diffusing screen over it, which just pops off and reveals there's an array of five lights in there. And I can turn them all on, I can turn one on, I can turn three on. Uh, there's controls in the back. Uh, but overall, if I turn this on for you, the effects are soft. You can see how it's a soft light, right? It's not like a spotlight. I'm not just going, wow, one single small light source. If we think about Rembrandt paintings, those are a smaller aperture, not a very wide light source. But if we think of somebody like Anders Zorn, who painted largely under natural light, it was a big window 
and it gets that nice soft light. For an absolute beginner, I would say that this size of a light source is a little too big, although totally workable, totally workable. But again, this is a little bit of an investment. We're talking like, you know, over $100 to get a set of these lights. They always only come in sets, which is kind of annoying. I only need the one. The cheaper and more advisable alternative would be to go to your local hardware store and buy what we call the clamp light. Uh, at the GCA, when we work on our cast drawings or if we set up still lifes in a room with no skylight, this is what we're using. It isn't something fancy like that. Um, I have in here just a hardware store bought light bulb that is at the temperature of 5000 K. That's the closest to neutral light, which is something I'm going to talk about more in a second when we talk about painting. If you're drawing, the temperature, meaning the color of the light, doesn't really matter. So long as it's a uh, good sized, small enough light source, it's three to five feet away from you, it does the job. They sell, and some instructors put this on their supply list, they sell this stuff called black foil. And it's essentially aluminum foil that is black and matte, meaning not reflecting at all. And that can be helpful to even uh, shorten this size light source. You make kind of like a cylinder around it in black foil, tape it onto the clamp light, and you've even narrowed your light source further, right? Because as we can see now, this comes out in a dish, and if it could come out in a, in a cylinder, more like a theater light, that might be even more desirable for that strong light source. Again, the temperature of the bulb doesn't matter if you're drawing, but hopefully you're in it for the long haul with us, and you'll end up taking a painting class, in which case I would say it's no more money, so when you're at the store and you're shopping for a light bulb, 5000K is the most neutral light, the closest to, let's say, if we're in the Northern Hemisphere, North Light. Uh, that's also what's in these soft boxes. It's pretty standard for, uh, for photography lights to not be strongly colored. And it's definitely something you want to avoid when you're a beginner painter. You want to stick to the neutral light sources. If you decide that you want to work under natural light, that's great. Um, that's how we do it at the GCA. We have banks of skylights in our figure studios, which are a larger aperture, and it makes the fall off of light a little softer. Um, my advice to beginners would be, well, my advice to pretty much everybody working in a situation like mine with a great big Florida ceiling window situation is to, again, decrease the aperture on that light source. So in my uh, studio scenario, when I want to work from natural light, which I do from time to time, I will block off the lower 75% of my windows so that I have just this narrow band of light that comes through and it kind of washes over my setups here in a nice left to right fashion. Um, another important thing is how you are situated with respect to your light, and that light is situated with respect to your objects. So we've covered all the different kinds of light sources you've bought, and we've covered how far away they should be from you, but now I want to talk about you and the light source, because that's another very important thing. If I were to pluck my sphere out of my still life setup here to make a, a point, let's imagine that the that we were looking at the sphere like this, and that the light was over here, like where my windows are, shining into my setup like this. Form, as we teach it at the GCA, is the effect of light on an opaque solid. If the light is striking it over here, I'm seeing the half of the moon, let's say, that's entirely in shadow, right? We can imagine that this sphere would be cut in half, and this is the light facing half of it. That means, all the form information is not visible to me. So the rule of thumb I want you to keep in mind is that when you set yourself up in your, in your studio or in the corner of your bedroom or wherever you end up working for, this, for any class, you want to be in a 180 degree situation, right? So the light source never goes past 90 degrees with your setup. Let's look at this setup here and talk about it. Getting the sphere to stay is never easy. <laughs> Go away. <clears throat> We've got this going on here. My light source right now, if I were to use this softbox, is too close. I'd move it back. 
but if it were as it is now, it's striking the objects right here, almost 90 degrees away from me, right? So that is what we would call side light. And that's as far as you can go. Any further than that, you start losing the form information and seeing more shadow than form information. And it becomes harder and harder to internalize some of the concepts that we're going to instruct you in. So try to keep your light between 90 degrees of you and the light source and right above your head. Right above your head or right next to your head or something like that is another very challenging situation. And let's talk about that for a second. To go back to my sphere, if the light is right here next to my head and we're looking at the sphere right ahead of us like this, that means that all the shadow information now is on the back side of that sphere. And you might say, well, you just said that all the form information is on the light side. Why is that not the ideal situation? And it's because all the midtones, all the tonal information that tells me that this thing is round is foreshortened back to the sides. That sounds confusing, but what you're really seeing is mostly the very light facing parts. An ideal circumstance, and this might not be doable in your home studio, but what we're aiming for would be something around 45 degrees. So let me show you really fast what that would look like. If this was where I was going to work, right? Easel uh, set up, I would want my light to be, I have to unplug it to show you this. I would want my light to be somewhere, my fan doesn't want to let me do this. Okay, hold on. Do it with the clamp light. <laughs> if I were looking for the ideal situation, I would find some way to suspend this light right about here. I always like to say if you're right-handed, you don't want to cast a shadow on your on your uh, paper or on your canvas. So you want it to be over your left shoulder and up above your head, a minimum of three feet away from your setup. That's ideal. That's going to give you some of that very beautiful light receiving information and a little bit of shadow. That's what we're always looking for. That's the easiest way to grapple with these advanced concepts. If you're left-handed, your easel would be on the other side and the light would be over your right hand shoulder. The reason that we're kind of handedly uh, biasing this is really because there's two things we want to avoid when standing at our easel. One is, like I just said, casting a shadow on your own easel. So if my light was over here and I'm right-handed, it would cast a little bit of a shadow all over my uh, working surface, which is just extremely distracting. A lot of times we can't see what we're doing. The reason that we can't just switch the easels optimally is that if my easel were over here and I was right-handed, then I'm looking over my arm all the time. And some people can work with that and some people find that very distracting. It's a little bit more forgivable than the casting the shadow problem. So again, the ideal, the ideal, is if you're right-handed, the light is 45 degrees above your left shoulder and a minimum of three to five feet away from your setup. And if you're left-handed, reverse all of that. Uh, another ideal that isn't always doable is to have the same light on your surface as is illuminating your setup. This becomes harder <laughs> for you to accommodate in that little corner of your bedroom sometimes. And so I don't want to like emphasize this like it's do or die, uh, but it is um, desirable. If you can accommodate it, it would be ideal. Uh, but the workaround for that is Let's say we're in a circumstance where I've got this light three to five feet away, but for whatever reason, my easel needs to be a little closer to me and my light can only illuminate my setup. That happens. That's often how we have to work. And in those circumstances, again, a trip to the hardware store, not the end of the world. We can buy a smaller clamp light that has an even smaller aperture. And maybe if we're being extra, we get some of that black foil and we put it around this 
and then this easily clamps onto our easel or whatever. We'll talk about um, working surfaces in a second. And we can point it just directly on our setup and make sure that it's not polluting our light source. The best way to tell that you only have one light source in your setup is to take something rather long and skinny, let's say a paintbrush or a, a knitting needle or a pencil or anything, and kind of stand it up in your setup where your objects are arranged and make sure that there's only one cast shadow falling from it. If you see an X on the other side of it, it means that you're uh, dealing with two light sources. So you want to make sure that you only have one light source. And this is a nice way to make sure. And that this is the most common scenario in which you'll find that you have two light sources. Now, <clears throat> for instance, I showed you this great big window, right? It has these blinds on it. And you can see it's pretty dim in here. Uh, it's not terribly light. And when I turned on my, my um, artificial light, it was much more prevalent in the setup. If you have no choice, but to set up in a room with some windows in it, and you need to, you want to make sure that you can isolate your uh, light source, then you can construct what we call a shadow box. Uh, I don't work with one because I like a nice big soft light and I often keep my blinds uh, covered, which works for me. But this is a dedicated studio and maybe you don't have, you know, the desire to hang blackout curtains over your nice windows, or you can't, you live in a big condo with a big window or something. Then there is a solution. Uh, we construct what we call a shadow box. Uh, this can be done with, you know, that Amazon box that you've been kind of squirreling away in the corner because you knew it would come in handy someday. Essentially, make it a diorama. You set in the place where you can work, which we'll talk about eye level, sitting, standing in a second, but put it where you're going to work so that the opening of the box is facing you and that'll create a little isolated environment that you can then shine the light into. You might find that you have to alter the box in some way. The safest way to alter the box would be to start by cutting the, the top of the diorama off and then shining a light into that. It can be very fun. You can get a kind of a cast shadow that runs over the background and maybe it makes it feel a little atmospheric. Just make sure again that you're only getting the one light source in it and that that light source is not clamped to the box but rather three to five feet away. So even if you have this, this nice, big, sturdy box and you're like, I oh, can just clamp the lamp right on top of it and shine it in, no, 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 three to five feet away. So <laughs> that's a really important one. Uh, another thing that I promised that we would talk about is sitting, standing, eye level, where, what do we do? Ideally, to get the least amount of perspective uh, problems cropping up in our life, we want our still life setup or whatever we're choosing to look at, be it a cast, anything like that. We want it to be around eye level or at an average of eye level. As you can see here, this is constructed for me to work standing. But as you can see here, maybe I have some brackets that allows me to lower this shelf, which is eye level for me sitting. Sometimes I sit when I work. It's not ideal. And I'll talk about that in a second, but, um, whatever, again, you can make work for you. I have this gorgeous easel that I got out of the Art Students League. Uh, they always throw their easels out at the end of the semester and you can buy them for very cheap. But if you're not so lucky, uh, you can very easily buy a not terribly expensive easel. Um, for long form things and for large figure drawings, things that are on like 18 by 24 paper, I would suggest avoiding these cheaper um, steel easels. They're very good for plain air painting. They're really nice because they're super portable, right? They collapse into nothing. And if you had nothing else, this would work. But the taller they become when you release the legs, they become less and less stable with large surfaces on them. So uh, for a small still life, this would work fine. Uh, but for something like an 18 by 24 drawing, you're going to find that it's a little flimsy. And again, having something larger and wood might be ideal. Um, what the most important thing that I would um, stress about choosing what you're going to clip your work to, to work on, would be that it is not terribly um, perspective to your eye, right? Don't let it 
be something that tilts way away from you, like if we were sitting and working on a drafting board. That actually is a great deal of work on our neck and it really uh, limits us in the ability to step back and look back and forth and check in with our work. So we want it to be straight up and down is ideal. This is straight up and down so that I'm not getting a lot of glare on my painting, or if it were a drawing up here, it's um, not being foreshortened away from me in any way, shape, or form. So <clears throat> straight up and down is one. I've seen students actually, you know, who didn't have the money for an easel, tape it to the wall. They'll tape a piece of drawing paper to the wall and they'll work on their drawing there. You just need it to be flat. Um, a picture frame would work fine. Anything that you can then clamp to something that's straight up and down. Back of a chair, turn a table on its side, get creative. But just make sure that it's sturdy and that it's straight up and down. Uh, it doesn't need to be an easel, I guess is what I'm really trying to uh, uh, press home to you. In terms of what you work on, this is a panel, I always paint on panels, but a lot of our classes are gonna have you working on smaller exercises and maybe things that aren't appropriate for uh, a panel. In which case you're gonna more likely be working on uh, something taped to or clamped to a board. And so let's talk about boards for just a second. Uh, this is your standard drawing board that you buy in the art supply store. It's you know a little bigger than 18 by 24 so that it can accommodate a full-size drawing pad with these clamps here. Um, and that's very nice. For most of the GCA drawing classes, you're going to be recommended this type of paper, which is the Strathmore 400. Uh, it's a nice, smooth, uh, not terribly expensive paper. And it fits on these drawing boards quite nicely. You just use whatever form of clamps you have there. And then these hardware store clips are very helpful because one of the most important things when drawing and painting is making sure that our board and our paper are level. So when you set up on your surface, make, maybe get out a little hardware store level. Uh, the Compass app in older iPhones has a level built into it, or you can download an app that's for leveling. They're all free. And just use the level in whatever way you can to make sure that this top of your board and the paper that's attached to it are both level. That way, if you get up, walk away, take your paper down, something happens, somebody moves your easel, lots of things can happen. And you go back the next day to maybe check an angle. If your board is tilted and you made the angle right on the first day, the angle's gonna appear wrong the next time. We don't want that. Another thing that I do, even in my studio, where I'm largely alone, is I tape the feet of my easel just to make sure that if it moves, it can get back to the right place. Because we work in the system of comparative measurements, it isn't the end of the world if your easel moves. Uh, it's a pretty um, forgiving system for uh, your setups, but you do wanna you know, ensure some kind of consistency in your, in your working habits, especially. So just try to, you know, make it static. Make sure that you can return to the same setup. Another thing that can be helpful if you have to put a still life together and then take it down for any reason is to mark on your surface with tape or with pencil or whatever where your objects were and then you can put them back. Um, that's pretty helpful. You do want the objects to be where you started with them. You don't want things moving around, but sometimes like an apple will die and I'll have to replace it. So I have it kind of taped off and I know exactly where the, the new apple goes. <clears throat> um, just for painting, uh, it can be really frustrating when you're casting a shadow on your palette. And so the suggestion that I make to a lot of my students who are in more confined spaces is to work a system that I call the parallel palette. Right, and that's just that you, in some way, affix your palette to your easel and then affix your painting next to your palette. Uh, that can be really helpful just to make sure that the same amount of light is getting on everything. That's a whole lot of information. So let me quickly um, recap. 
What's the first and most important thing about working in this uh, controlled environment that will give us the visual experience of form? It is a single light source that is three to five to as many feet as you like away, but a minimum, very minimum of three. I would say ideal would be around five. The second is in painting that we want it to be a rather neutral light. Uh, that means that your light bulb should be 5000 K. Or if you're working under a natural light source, uh, first of all, remember to uh, reduce the aperture on that natural light source. And second of all, make sure that if you're in the northern hemisphere, that light is as close to north as possible. North changes the least amount. South changes the most, especially in the winter months. East and west are doable, but you cannot work while the sun is coming in through the window. If you're in the southern hemisphere, reverse everything I said, but because you guys are used to northern hemisphere uh, thinking, um, you'll know what to do. South light in the southern hemisphere changes the least, north light the most. Um, east and west are a problem for everybody. So it, it's doable, but you have to stop working when the light is in the window, absolutely. Other recap is to make sure that your uh, working surface is straight up and down and level. Another important arrangement for your studio is to make sure that the light is somewhere between 90 degrees between you and the still life setup, right? So here's my still life setup right in front of me. Here's 90 degrees, right? It makes a right angle. The light has to exist somewhere in here or in here. Try to avoid keeping it right above your head and try to avoid anything past that 90 degree point. That way you'll see a nice distribution of light and shadow and that's gonna make the easiest experiment or experience for making some kind of form. Any questions about any of this should be addressed to your instructors. Before I made this helpful little tutorial for you, they were responsible for instructing you in all these things, so they're quite used to it. And they will have some maybe helpful suggestions that even I didn't cover in this little setup tutorial. So best of luck, happy painting, and I hope to see all of you in future GCA classes.